above board above board is an idiom which means being fair and righteous that is to be very honest and legal not involving any kind of tricks doing something straightforward without concealment without hiding anything and if something is done openly that is called above board so this idiom has another way of saying also they are be above board open and above board honest and above board so all these expressions give the same meaning that doing something very fair righteously honestly legally without hiding and doing something openly and let us try to see this idiom in the sentences the first one is if a plan or a business agreement is above board it is honest and not trying to deceive anyone so if agreement is said to be above board it is nothing but it is very honest legally approved and it is not there to cheat anyone and the second one don't try to be very smart my friend we have to make this deal to be above board totally and if your friend is trying to play any tricks while making any deal you can warn your friend saying that this deal is an above board deal totally which means it's an open deal we have to make it very legally don't play any tricks the third one i think these documents are above board sir go ahead and sign them maybe a secretary after checking all the documents found that all the documents were legal they are very fair right and she may be advising the boss to sign the documents because the documents are above board and the next one the deal between two parties was completely honest and above board so two parties are there very fairly openly doing this deal that's the reason it is called an above board deal the next one ravi is straight forward all his dealings are above board so ravi is a open minded person he never hides anything that's the reason all his dealings are above board very fair very right very legal he doesn't play any tricks and let us see how this idiom has come into existence there are two stories available the first one is according to some scholars the board in this expression in this idiom refers to a table an above board deal is one that is done in an open manner the hands of the participants involved are out in the open for everyone to see there are no underhand dealings involved so who are the participants involved in doing the deal they keep their hands on the table openly so all the audience can see what is going on about the table and nothing is underhand no otherwise dealings and that is how it has come into existence let us see the other explanation how this idiom has come into existence and this explanation is something which is related to the smuggling of goods on the ships in the olden days people who used to smuggle the things which are contraband which are illegal they used to keep all the items goods which are illegal below the deck on the other hand they used to place all the legal goods which are legally transported goods in the plain sight of the deck so that everybody can see in other words anything that was placed on the deck was an above board so that is how it has come into existence so finally we can understand that an above board activity is an activity which is very fair and righteous legal activity without involving any tricks and if something is done openly without any secrets it is called an above board activity achilles heel achilles heel it is an idiom it means a weakness or a vulnerable spot the weakest point in one's character 
or nature where it is easiest for other people to attack or criticize. In other words, it is an individual's weakness, something that other people can attack or take advantage of. So it is in general we can say it's a weakness or vulnerable spot on which others can attack. So how to pronounce this word? A is pronounced as A as in China, CH is pronounced as Ka as in Kiss, I is pronounced as E as in It, E is pronounced as E as in Peel, Yes is pronounced as Z as in Zip. So finally it has to be pronounced as Achilles. So the stress is on key. So that is how it has to be pronounced. So let us see this idiom in the examples. The first one, the corrupt minister is regarded as the government's Achilles heel and is expected to resign. So the minister is the weakness for this government. Why? Because he is corrupted. That is the reason the opponents can attack on the government. So minister is the Achilles heel. So he is the weak point, vulnerable point for the government. The second one is Rani's stubbornness is her Achilles heel. She can't be polite. So what is the weakness of Rani? Stubbornness, rudeness. So it is her weakness. So her weakness is stubbornness. So it is her Achilles heel. So she cannot be polite. Third one is Ramesh's Achilles heel is stress. He just can't handle it. Again the same thing. Ramesh's weakness is stress. He can't handle this. So Ramesh's Achilles heel is stress. And the fourth example. English speaking has always been Achilles heel to many people in the world. So, so many people feel English speaking is very difficult and that is their weakness. So, it is their Achilles heel. And the next one, though he was a good person, his short temper was his Achilles heel. So, his weakness is his short temper. So, it is his Achilles heel. So, there is a story which is from Greek mythology how this idiom has come into existence. So, according to Greek mythologies, Achilles was a famous Greek warrior. As soon as he was born, his mother, Thetis, dipped him in the river Styx in order to make him invincible, that is immortal. Legends has told her that no harm would come to a person who had been dipped in that river. Unfortunately, for Achilles, when his mother immersed, dipped him, she held him by the heel. As a result, the water never touched this portion of his foot. The heel became Achilles' weak spot, weak place. He died in the Trojan War when an arrow pierced this heel. So, this is how the story came into existence and the idiom became alive today. So, finally we understand Achilles' heel is nothing but a weak or a vulnerable spot where the other people can attack easily. Adam's heel. Adam's heel. It is an idiom in English language which means a plain water, a plain drinking water. Sometimes it is a funny way to refer to a glass of water also. It's quite surprising, right? Let us see this idiom in the sentences. The first one, if the kids feel tired, let them have a glass of Adam's ale from the tap. So if the kids are really tired, we are asking the kids to drink a glass of water from the tap. Glass of Adam's ale means glass of water from the tap. The second one, I don't have any soft drinks. Would you be interested in Adam's ale? If a guest comes to your house and there are no drinks available at your house and you are asking the guest to have water, would you be interested in Adam's ale means would you be interested in drinking water? That's it. The third one, it is very hot outside. 
I could really do with an iced cold glass of Adam's ale. It's summer, it's very hot outside, you came home and you wanted to have a cold glass of Adam's ale, means a cold glass of water. That's it. The fourth one, we are teetotalers, we will each have a glass of Adam's ale, please. Teetotalers means they never touch any other drinks except water. So, obviously, they will be interested in only water. That's the reason we will have a glass of Adam's ale. Means we will have a glass of water, please. That's it. No other drink. The fifth one, would you like to wash it down with Adam's ale? Maybe something is there on others' shirt and you are asking them if they are really willing to wash that with water, with Adam's ale. That's it. So, Adam's ale is nothing but water. Let us see the origin of this idiom. This is an old and rarely heard idiom which is used in a joking fashion to refer to a glass of water sometime. And it is based on the biblical story of Adam and Eve and which alludes to the assumption that Adam had only water to drink that time. Because in the biblical time, the only thing that Adam and Eve would have had to drink was water because there were no other drinks available at that time. So that's the reason Adam's ale means water. And in Scotland, Adam's ale is also referred to Adam's wine. It's a drink available in Scotland, Adam's wine. So finally, we understand Adam's ale is nothing but a plain drinking water. Add insult to injury. Add insult to injury. It is an idiom. It means to act in a way that makes a bad situation worse. That is to worsen an unfavorable or uncomfortable situation. In other words, to further hurt the feelings of someone who has been already hurt. That's really bad, right? Let's see this in the examples. The first one. First, they lost the match and then to add insult to injury, one of the players was suspended for cheating. There are two incidents. First, losing the match is bad. The worst thing is one of the player was suspended. This is really to add insult to injury. So making the bad situation worse. The second sentence, they were already stranded in the middle of nowhere without any conveyance. Then to add insult to injury, it started to rain. The problem became more complicated, right? They lost their way home. They are somewhere without any facility and to add insult to injury to increase the problem then it started raining it is nothing but worsening the situation. The third one not only did the company suspended him it also penalized him rupees 1 lakh as a punishment that's adding insult to injury. Not only suspending the person it also penalizing the person. It's really hurting the feelings of that person. It is really adding insult to injury. Already that person was suspended. Again, he has to pay 1 lakh rupees. That's really adding insult to injury. The fourth one, I was already getting late for work, stuck in the traffic. And to add insult to injury, I was stopped by the police for speeding. It's a common sight in traffic areas. So already you are late for the office and police stops you. You are late already, that is a bad situation. And if police stops, that's really worse situation. In that case, you add insult to injury. The fifth one, people were forced to work longer hours. And to add insult to injury, the company decided not to give pay raise. Company is asking the workers to work for long hours. That is a bad situation. On the other hand, it is not raising their salaries. That is really add insult to injury. That is making a bad situation worse. It's very bad, right? So, 
when it comes to the origin of this idiom this is an ancient idiom which is taken from a roman writer fedros story the bald man and the fly the bald man and the fly the story goes like this a bald man tries to hit the fly that has landed on his forehead he gave himself a heavy blow while he was trying to crush it but then the fly jeered as a result he smacks his own head instead the fly tells the man you want to kill me for a mere touch what have you done to yourself now that you have added insult to injury so there are two losses for this bald man the bad situation became the worst so this idiom was first recorded in 1948 in english language so finally we understand that to add insult to injury means to act in a way that makes a bad situation worse that is to worsen an uncomfortable or unfavorable situation that is to hurt the feelings of somebody who has been already hurt a lick and a promise a lick and a promise it is an idiom it means to do a job in a careless and hurried manner to do something half heartedly which means it's a quick and careless attempt to do something not doing some work willingly not doing some work whole heartedly it is doing work half heartedly let us see it in the examples the first one every morning i put on my uniform give my shoe a lick and a promise and rush to school normally going to school itself is not a willing activity whereas i put uniform and i don't like to clean the shoe i don't like to polish the shoe that's the reason i give shoe a lick and a promise i do it very casually half heartedly and rush to school second one my mother insisted to dust the furniture so i gave it a lick and a promise and went to bed so throughout the day you may be working at house and you wanted to take rest but your mother was insisting you to clean the furniture what would you do and of course you would give a lick and a promise and go to bed which means you would do it very quickly carelessly and then you go to bed that's it and the third one they gave the budget problems a lick and a promise and then moved on to the next issue this is quite natural in politics so wherever the money is involved for such problems they give a lick and a promise they do it carelessly and they do it half heartedly and wherever it is not involved they move to that issue that's it and the next one most of the students give their homework a lick and a promise so normally teachers tell the students to do their homework slowly whole heartedly whereas the students give the homework a lick and a promise they do it very fast carelessly and half heartedly not all the students some of the students and the fifth one he gave the car a lick and a promise maybe the owner asked the worker to clean the car very carefully slowly whole heartedly but what have the worker done he did it carelessly hurried manner half heartedly that's the reason he gave a lick and a promise that's it no this idiom has come into existence due to its own meaning which means in informal context the word lick means a hasty wash a hasty wash therefore in the context of the idiom the word is used to mean hasty hasty the promise here in this idiom refers to the assurance that the worker or workers will do a thorough job sometime later that is a quite routine normal way that the workers 
give such kind of assurances to their owners. That's it. So finally, we understand a lick and a promise means to do a job in a careless and hurried manner. To do something half-heartedly. Which means a quick and careless attempt to do something. All betras around the neck. All betras around the neck. It is an idiom. It means a heavy burden that prevents one from achieving success. That is something that is problematic to someone and hinders which means stops their progress. It is because of some wrong that they have done in the past. So if you have done something wrong in the past that stops your progress somewhere that hinders your progress in the future. So that is the meaning of albatross around the neck. Let us see this idiom in the sentences. The first one, the failed real estate scheme became an albatross around Raju's neck. For now, he could not attract the other investors in a new project. So Raju has done some mistake in real estate scheme. So he failed. So that failure has become a problem that is a, an albatross around Raju's neck and now he is not able to attract the new investors, new customers for the project. So that failure is a hindrance. So is an albatross around Raju's neck. The next one, according to my mother, the old car is an albatross around my father's neck. So mother says, father did a mistake by buying an old car and now he has been spending a lot of money on repairs of this old car. So this old car has become an albatross around father's neck because it is stopping his progress. The third one, imperfection has become an albatross around Rani's neck. Her boss rejects all her new proposals without even looking at them. Rani might have done some wrong in the past and the boss realized that Rani was imperfect. So that imperfection is a problem for Rani's growth, progress. And that imperfection has become an albatross around her neck because of which the boss never looks at any project that was proposed by Rani. So that is the hindrance for Rani's growth. And the fourth one, killing the wild deer has become an albatross around Salman's neck. The high court has given three years of imprisonment as a punishment. So Salman did some wrong by killing the deer and that has become a greatest hindrance for his life. And that has become an albatross around his neck and because of which he got a punishment of three years imprisonment. And the fifth one, taking house loan has become an albatross around Sita's neck. For now, she has lost her job and couldn't repay the loan. So Sita did a mistake by taking the loan and that loan she is not able to pay right now because she lost her job. And that has become a greatest hindrance for Sita's career. So it is an albatross around Sita's neck. Let us try to understand the background of this idiom. An albatross is a large bird. It's a white bird which is found at sea. Sailors who sail in the sea believe that this bird brings good luck, but killing it brings bad luck. And this idiom, albatross around the neck, refers to lines from the poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, written in 1798 by Samuel Tyler Coleridge. This poem tells the story of a sailor who killed an albatross. As soon as the bird was killed, things went terribly wrong on the ship. 
the wind died and the crew ran out of the drinking water. The shipmates became very angry and finally they hung the dead albatross around the sailor's neck as a sign of his guilt. The shipmates realized that by killing this albatross they got bad luck. So finally we understand that albatross around the neck is nothing but a heavy burden or heavy problem that prevents us from achieving success. And the burden is because of some mistake that we have done in the past. All ears, all ears, all ears is an idiom. It means eager to listen to or ready to pay attention to what someone has to say. That is, if someone says that they are all ears, they mean that they are ready and eager to listen to. So when you say all ears, it means you are ready to listen to. Let us see it in the examples. The first one, kids in my class were all ears when I was telling them the story. So when I tell the story to kids, they really love it and they are ready to listen to the story very much. And the second one, tell me everything that happened at the party I am all ears. Which means I did not attend the party, somebody attended and I am telling them, I am asking them, please tell me I am ready to listen to what had happened in the party. So I am all ears, means I am ready to listen. And the third one, when the Telugu teacher read out our marks, we were all ears. We were very keen. We were listening to. So when Telugu teacher was reading the marks, we were very keen and paying attention to listen to. That's the reason we were all ears. And the fourth one, are you listening to me? Yes, I am all ears. And if somebody asks, and that is the answer, yes, I am all ears means as I am ready, I am ready to listen to, as I am listening. And the fifth one, she had expected him to be all ears when she told him about her wedding plans. So she expected that he will listen to her. We don't know whether he listened or not, but she expected that to be all ears. So he will be all ears. Whether he was or not, we don't know. So. Normally, when we look at the meaning of this idiom, when you say you are all ears, you are implying that all the other senses are almost non-existent. That is, they are not in working mode except your ears. So, your ears alone are fully functional. You therefore eager to hear or listen to what someone has to say. That's it. So when you say I am all ears, it simply means that you are ready and eager to listen to what someone has to say. All hell broke loose. All hell broke loose. It is an idiom. It means pandemonium. That is a situation that is completely out of control. An uproar, confusion, if all hell breaks loose, it is called a situation suddenly becomes noisy and violent. Usually with a lot of people arguing or fighting. So all hell broke loose means a situation that is not in control. Let us see this idiom. In the examples. The first one, when the students were told that their demands would not be met, all hell broke loose. Students were agitating. The principal came out and told that their demands will not be addressed. Then all the students started shouting, arguing and they became violent. Then all hell broke loose. The second one, all hell broke loose when the teacher had left the classroom. This is quite natural. When teacher is present, students are very calm and peaceful. When teacher leaves the class, 
they start fighting, shouting and doing all mischievous things, then all hell broke loose. The third one, when one policeman drew his gun and then suddenly all hell broke loose. People are hesitating very peacefully, but suddenly a policeman took out his gun. Then all people started fighting and they became violent and they shouted like anything. Then all hell broke loose. The fourth example, one guy pushed another at the bar and then all hell broke loose. That's why we left. So somebody asked me why you left the bar. So one guy disturbed the entire thing and the fight started and all hell broke loose. There is a lot of arguing, fighting in the bar. That's the reason we left the bar. The fifth one, don't take her into the party fold or all hell will let loose. She is not good in her conduct. So if you take her into the party, then our party will become a fighting club. So all hell will let loose if you take her into the party. We will not control anyone. So let us try to see and understand the origin of this idiom. The English author and poet John Milton is responsible for the origin of this idiom. In his epic poem, Paradise Lost, Paradise Lost, this expression appears as wherefore with thee came not all hell broke loose. Wherefore with thee came not all hell broke loose. Milton's poem is a biblical story about Satan. Satan is an angel who rebelled against God and was forced out of heaven into hell. Before he was thrown out of the garden of Eden, Satan met Gabriel. Gabriel, an angel who acted as a messenger from God. Gabriel asked the Satan, Wherefore with thee came not all hell broke loose? It is because of you the entire hell became hell. So the origin of this idiom comes from John Milton's Paradise Lost. So finally we understand the idiom all hell broke loose means it's a pandemonic situation. A situation that is completely out of control and which involves a lot of people arguing, fighting, not at all listening to each other. All thumbs. It is an idiom and it means a clumsy or awkward in doing or using something. That is to be very inelegant and uncoordinated when it comes to working with one's hands. If you are not able to do some work with your hands properly, coordinatedly, that is called all thumbs in English. Let us see this idiom in the examples. The first one, I am all thumbs with arts and crafts, but my daughter is great at it. So you are not good at arts and crafts. You are not able to do arts and crafts in a good manner. You can't do with your own hands because you are all thumbs. You are not perfect in doing that. But your daughter is perfect. That's it. The second one. Do I have to play the piano or guitar? Are you serious? I am all thumbs. So here you are asked to play piano or guitar. But you don't know how to play. That's the reason you say I am all thumbs. I am not good at playing. I don't know how to play the piano or guitar. So I am all thumbs, not good at all. I can't play. That's it. The third one, I never ask Raju to dust those expensive vases. He is all thumbs. Raju is not good at cleaning these expensive vases, anything. So that's the reason I never asked him to clean. Because he is all thumbs, because he doesn't know how to work on these expensive vases because he is all thumbs. And the fourth one, I asked Rani to thread the needle, but she couldn't. She is all thumbs today. She is all thumbs today means she is not in a good condition to do that particular work which was given to Rani. What work? 
to thread the needle she can't do it today because she is all thumbs she is not good she is awkward she is not clear of doing that particular work today and the fifth one i wish i could paint like you but i am all thumbs i wanted to paint like you because i like painting but i don't know how to paint because i am all thumbs i am not good at painting because i am all thumbs so this idiom is quite simple right it has come into origin with the idea that if all your fingers were thumbs normally we have only one thumb to one hand four other fingers are normal fingers you would be unable to do many things if you have all five thumbs right if you have all five thumbs instead of one thumb you can't do many things whatever you can do today now so it is how this idiom came into existence so if you have all thumbs to your hand as you cannot do any work perfectly if you say i am all thumbs you are awkward in doing or using something you don't know how to use it or you are not so elegant or you are not coordinated in doing some work then you are all thumbs always a bridesmaid and never a bride always a bridesmaid and never a bride it is an idiom it means to never fulfill your ambition your goal and you are always the second best not the first a person who makes it to the finals but never wins the finals never wins the contest he will be always the second place he will never go to the first place and when a person is such type we say he is always a bridesmaid never a bride let us see it in the examples the first one when will i get a promotion i am so sick of being always the bridesmaid never the bride so this man has been working for 10 years in the same position he never got promotion and he is vexed with that job and he says he is very sick of being always bridesmaid other people are getting promotions not me i am always the second person i never got the promotion the second one this is the fifth time he has come in second place always the bridesmaid never the bride he participated in the event this is the fifth time he is participating this time also he stood in the second place there is somebody who took the first place so that's the reason he was always the bridesmaid never the bride he never became the first he was the second person the third one her win in this race helped to destroy the idea that she is always the bridesmaid never the bride people used to believe that she will never win the race but this time she won the race when she won the race and people realized yes she also be the winner but people used to believe that she was always bridesmaid she would never win the race but now she broke that belief and she won the race the fourth one my cousin took part in the elections and lost again she is always a bridesmaid and never a bride so again my cousin participated in the contested in the elections and she lost the election not only this the first time she did it many times so she is always the second best not the first the fifth one my friend ranjit is a wonderful actor but unfortunately she is always a bridesmaid and never a bride ranjit is a wonderful actor but he is not getting the opportunities to become a hero whatever role that he wanted to enact so that's the reason he is always a bridesmaid never a bride so this is a quite natural idiom and probably this idiom has originated in the words of 1917 song by charles collins and lily morris why am i always the bridesmaid never the blushing bride it's quite natural that in marriage season bride always gets the attention of the public whereas the bridesmaid is the second focus of the attention nobody focuses attention on bridesmaid the entire attention will be on only the bride 
so that's the reason always a bridesmaid never a bride means you will never be the first person in your life you will be the second best in your life american dream american dream it's a kind of philosophy that with hard work courage and determination anyone can prosper and achieve success and this success often is referred with materialistic success that is materialistic gain in simple words if you lead a happy and successful life it is called an american dream so american dream is to lead a life of success let us see this in the examples the first one the american dream is not easy to achieve you need to work really hard it's of course true if you really want to be successful in your life you need to work hard so the american dream is not very easy to achieve success is not very easy to achieve that's it the second one the young couple from india living the american dream so the young couple is living a successful life so happy successful life the third one after 10 years of hard work we finally have a big house and successful careers we are living the american dream so now we are successful it doesn't happen in one day it happened after 10 years it involved 10 years of hard work and now we are leading a successful life that is an american dream the fourth one with good jobs a nice house two children and plenty of money they believed they were living the american dream so they thought all these things are required to be successful and they got and that's the reason they are leading the american dream they are living the american dream they are living the successful life the fifth one raju is living the american dream he has the wife the two kids and the house with a garden so of course if you have all of them it's a success right and that's the reason that is called living the american dream so this idiom was first used by james truslow adams in his book epic of america it was written in 1931 in it he wrote the american dream is that dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for everyone with opportunity for each according to their ability or achievement so american dream is nothing but leading a successful life often it is referred to a materialistic gain apple of one's eye apple of one's eye it is an idiom it means a prized possession that is an object or a person which or whom you like and look after with a great deal of devotion in other words someone or something that is very precious to you in simple words if you love someone he or she is regarded an apple of your eye that's it let us see this in the examples the first one sunita is the apple of her father's eye so her father loves sunita very much and that's the reason sunita is apple of her father's eye the second one she has three children but her youngest son is the apple of her eye though she has three children she loves all three of them but the youngest she loves the most that's the reason the youngest is the apple of her eye the third one while my grandfather loved all of us very much my younger brother was the apple of his eye so this may be experience of many of us so grandfather used to love all of us equal but somewhere he loved the younger brother very much more than all of us that's the reason the younger brother was the apple of his eye the fourth one radha was a very charming little girl and a very bright student and was the apple of her teacher's eyes so automatically if the student is bright teachers love the student very much and it happened with radha also since she was very bright 
and little charming girl so all teachers loved her very much that's the reason she was the apple of her teachers eyes fifth one my granddaughter is the apple of my eye said the old man lovingly looking at her playing in the distance so girl is playing at the distance and grandfather is looking at her and telling to someone that she is the apple of his eyes so let us try to understand how this idiom came into existence so in the idiom the apple does not refer to the fruit but the pupil in one's eye people felt that the shape of the pupil was similar to the shape of an apple in fact for quite some time the word apple was used to refer to both the eye and the fruit the pupil is a priceless possession for without it we would be unable to see since vision is something that all human beings value the expression apple of one's eye came to mean something that is greatly valued or treasured so this expression first appeared in old english in 885 ad in a work attributed to king alfred the great of wessex and it was later used by shakespeare in 1600 in his play a midsummer night's dream so finally we understand an apple of one's eye means something or someone that you love the most or something or someone that is very precious to you apple of discord apple of discord anything that causes discord jealousy dispute argument or rivalry in other words something that causes trouble or unhappiness or which is cause for dispute let us see it in the example the first one the boundary line between the countries was an apple of discord between the two countries it's quite natural nowadays so boundary line is a key source of rivalry between these two countries that's the reason it is an apple of discord it's the reason for the fight the second one this Kashmir seems to be an apple of discord between the India and the Pakistan so Kashmir is the source for dispute between the India and the Pakistan that's the reason it is an apple of discord between India and the Pakistan the third one this wealth of father becomes an apple of discord between two brothers so as soon as father died his wealth brought rivalry between two brothers that's the reason it became an apple of discord between two brothers the fourth one the best employee award has been an apple of discord among the co-workers for quite a some time this is quite natural when one employee was given the best employee award all other employees became rivalry to that particular employee that's the reason it has become an apple of discord that award has become an apple of discord among all the workers the fifth one the water sharing project has been the apple of discord between the two states we can see this experience among many states in this country itself so this water project has become the rivalry between those two states so it is the apple of discord between two states and now let us look at the origin of this particular idiom and this is originated taken from the greek mythology according to greek mythology when greek gods thetis and Peleus got married they invited all the greek gods except the god of discord eris to their wedding it makes sense doesn't it nobody wants a disagreement or a quarrel during a wedding but eris was so angry because she hadn't been invited for the marriage so she decided to spoil the event by tossing a golden apple among the guests on the apple were written three words for the fairest three goddesses hera athena and aphrodite 
fought for the apple because each believed that she was the fairest of them all. They asked Paris, the prince of Troy, to decide the matter for them. Each goddess tried to bribe Paris into giving her the apple. Hera promised him all of Asia and Athena promised him glory in war. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, promised him the most beautiful woman in the world, a woman whose face was capable of launching a thousand ships. Young Paris gave the apple to Aphrodite and he got the beautiful Helen in return. Hera and Athena, as expected, were extremely angry with Paris and they plotted his ruin. And finally, they ensured that the beautiful city of Troy was destroyed in the Trojan War. So, this is a story behind this idiom, Apple of Discord. So, finally, we understand Apple of Discord is nothing but anything that causes dispute, rivalry or trouble, unhappiness. Apple Pie Order Apple pie order, it is an idiom. It means in perfect order. That is when everything has been neatly arranged and things are in their proper place. It is called apple pie order. That is neat and tidy in arrangements. Everything in the correct place. Then it is called an apple pie order. Let us see it in the examples. The first one, when I opened the fridge, Everything was arranged in apple pie order, which means everything was arranged in the correct manner, in the right manner. The second one, everything still has to be in apple pie order, even though he left the army years ago. So he left the army and came to village, but he still follows some rules very strictly. He wants everything to be in the correct place and correct order. That's the reason he believes everything should be in apple pie order. The third one, everything in the cupboard was arranged in apple pie order. Everything was kept properly in their proper place. That's the reason it is in apple pie order. The fourth one, my mother is always cleaning the house is in apple pie order. It is quite natural. Every mother does it. And they keep everything in their proper place. That's the reason every house is in apple pie order. The fifth one. This room is a mess. By the time I return, I want everything to be in apple pie order. Maybe a teacher is telling the students to clean their room and keep everything in the correct place. So that's it. So the origin of this idiom is uncertain. It may have something to do with the French phrase nappe play. It means neatly folded. It was first recorded in English in the late 70s. Anyhow, some people, however, believe that it was a colonial. That's what Americans call before they got independence. Housewife living in New England who made the idiom popular. The story goes that this lady was in the habit of baking seven apple pies every Sunday one pie for every day of the coming week. Once the pies had been baked and cooled, she proceeded to place them on different shelves. The pie that was to be eaten on Monday was placed on the first shelf, the one to be eaten on Tuesday on the shelf next to it, and so on. The lady was so meticulous that she made sure that all pies were lined up just right. So this is how it came into existence. So finally, we understand that an apple pie order is nothing but everything in perfect order. Argus eyed. Argus eyed. It is an idiom. It means keen sighted. That is extremely observant and sharp sighted. And in other words, to be watchful and vigilant. To be watchful and vigilant. Let's see this in the examples. The first one, the detective is Argus eyed and knows everybody. So he works as a detective and he is very vigilant 
watchful and he knows everybody in the second one the guardians were honest men they watched the dollars of their ward with all jealous eyes of argus so the watchmen are really very careful vigilant and observant and they are securing or safeguarding the dollars with argus eyes means very carefully very watchfully without taking any rest the third one the police were watching the proceedings argus eyed so police were really or extremely observant regarding the process or proceedings of the government which were given or the things which are going on very carefully they are watching they are not acting upon it they are watching that's it the fourth one the student found it too difficult to get past the argus eyed watchman the student may be late to the school and he wanted to get into the school escaping the watchman but the watchman was very observant watchful vigilant keen sighted that's the reason the student felt it was very difficult to pass by the watchman the fifth one the minister however set argus with the hundred eyes to watch his company so he had a company and he is watching very carefully very vigilantly very observantly keen sighted each and every point and he is knowing everything that's the reason the minister is argus eyed with the hundred eyes which which means he is extremely observant with his company that's it let us see the origin of this idiom argos is a greek word it means all eyes all eyes and there is a story how this idiom has come into existence let us see it argus was a giant who had 50 pairs of eyes juno the wife of gias asked argus to keep an eye on her young cow heifer named lo the vigilant argus stood guard so it is guarding lo and when he felt drowsy he allowed only two of his eyes to close the remaining 49 pairs of eyes were focused on young cow lo unfortunately for the giant the messenger of the gods mercury became interested in the heifer and decided to steal it in order to achieve this mercury began playing his lyre the music was so soothing that argus fell asleep all 100 eyes were closed mercury drew his sword and promptly chopped off the giant's head when juno saw what had happened she removed the eyes from the head of the giant and placed them all on the tail of a peacock this explains why we talk about the eyes on a peacock's feather so this idiom from this story has come into existence argus is a name of a peacock also so finally argus eyed means keen sighted extremely observant to be watchful and vigilant armchair critic armchair critic it is an idiom it means someone who has become knowledgeable by reading sitting in his or her favorite armchair that is a person with little or no practical knowledge in other words someone who criticizes other people but does not have any proper experience of the activity what exactly the other people are doing for such people we call an armchair critic for example the first one if you want words of wisdom from an armchair critic you can go to rani so rani has a lot of knowledge because she read lot of books but no practical knowledge she talks very knowledgeably and if you want wisdom you go to rani without practical knowledge she criticizes that's the reason she is an armchair critic 
the second one i want someone who has dealt with this problem not some armchair critic so right now i am in the problem and i want somebody who has already dealt this problem not someone who never had any experience so i don't want any armchair critic right now because i have to get out of this problem the third one stop being an armchair critic and let me fix my car since i actually know what i'm doing here your car is under repair and you are doing it somebody came and they are advising so many things without any knowledge but you know it then you warn him stop being an armchair critic don't tell me because i know it the fourth one that guy is such an armchair critic no experience but plenty of advice it's quite natural most of the time in our life many people without having any practical experience try to advise us that's the reason we call them that guys as an armchair critic the fifth one everybody is an armchair critic said commander surya the senior police officer so maybe press they're asking so many questions or they're criticizing so many things about some incident that's the reason the commander surya police officer made this statement everybody is an armchair critic they never had any practical experience but we have the experience that's the reason we never criticize so the origin of this idiom is fairly obvious and very clearly understood and it came into existence in the late 19th century and this expression began to mean criticism of matters in which a critic means a critic who makes criticism does not take any active part he was not involved in the activity he simply sits and criticizes so an armchair critic is a person who had no practical knowledge but he gives advices and criticizes most of the time and that person is called an armchair critic arms of marfus arms of marfus it's an idiom it means sound asleep that is a deep sleep in other words an uncontrolled and dreamy sleep that is called arms of marfus let us see it in the examples the first one ranjit was in the arms of marfus when the telephone rang so when the telephone was ringing ranjit ranjit was sleeping uncontrollably he was in deep sleep that's the reason ranjit was in the arms of marfus when the telephone rang the second one ankita has been in the arms of marfus all her life so ankita led the entire life in a dreamy sleep she used to dream always she used to sleep always she never lived an awakened life that's the reason she left that's the reason ankita has been in the arms of marfus the third one the baby is finally in the arms of marfus please don't wake her baby after playing two or three hours continuously fell a sound asleep that's the reason the baby is in the arms of marfus which means she is in the deep sleep the fourth one the instant people start talking the deficit of my eyelids droop and often i go in the arms of morphus so many people look at my eyes drooping but they don't find that sometimes i go into deep sleep also they will not observe me that's the reason sometimes i go in the arms of morphus the fifth one if the book business is full of people cradled in the arms of morphus narish is confident that he is not one of them people believe that reading books get us sleep a sound sleep uncontrolled sleep and narish also wrote a book but his book does not bring any sleep to anyone while you read book you don't sleep that's the reason he is very confident his book is not in the arms of marfus so this idiom is from greek mythology so the word marfus is the name of a greek god of sleep or the god of dreams in rome and greek mythology so when you are in the arms of marfus it means 
you are in the land of dreams and sleep deep sleep and one more thing it is from this name morphus we get the word morphine in the medicine morphine so finally we have to use this idiom as in the arms of morphus in the arms of morphus which means a sound sleep that is deep sleep that is an uncontrolled and dreamy sleep ask for the moon ask for the moon it is an idiom it means to make requests or demands that are extraordinary or unreasonable in simple words to ask for something that is impossible not possible at all so let us see it in the examples the first one Meghana wants her husband to go on a diet and lose weight about 20 kg. I think she is asking for the moon. The husband is not willing to lose weight, not do any exercise. But Meghana, the wife is asking. I think she is asking for the moon. I think she is asking for the thing which is not possible by her husband. The second one. The new teacher wants her students to come to class on time. Frankly, he is asking for the moon. The children never had the habit of coming to school on time. The new teacher doesn't know, but he wants everybody to be in the school on time. The teacher doesn't know that he is asking for something that is impossible. That's the reason he is asking for the moon. The third one, we have to be realistic and not ask for the moon. So when you ask something, you have to be very realistic. Don't ask for something very impossible. So don't ask for the moon. Fourth one, because according to them, I had a tendency to ask for the moon as well as all the planets. They think I ask for the moon. They think that I always request or demand for which is extraordinary or unreasonable. That's the reason they think that I ask for the moon. The fifth one, I just asked them if we could go to lunch a little earlier and they have acted like I am asking for the moon. What did I say? I told them to go for lunch a little earlier. They thought I was asking for something impossible. They were acting like that. That's the reason they were acting as if I was asking for the moon. So this idiom is quite simple that it is related to our childhood. Like when we were kids, as every child asks their parent for the moon, it is like that. So it's like a small child asking her parents for the moon, which is not at all possible for the parents to bring the moon so finally ask for the moon is nothing but to ask for something that is not possible asleep at the switch asleep at the switch it's an idiom it means not doing or paying attention to that which is important or for which one is responsible in other words, failing to do one's job competently, correctly. When one fails to do job correctly, it is called asleep at the switch. Let us see it in the examples. The first one, the thieves managed to break into the house and the watchman was asleep at the switch. So watchman failed to watch exactly because the thieves already broke into some house and stole so many things so the watchman failed in his job that's the reason the watchman was asleep at the switch the second one according to some journalists the bomb blasts happened because the intelligence team was asleep at the switch the intelligence team failed in their job that's the reason the bomb blast took place that's the reason we say the intelligence team was asleep at the switch the third one, I think the secretary of the state is asleep at the switch. The state is not running its businesses properly. They are in dilemma. 
because the secretary failed in doing his job that's the reason we said the secretary of the state is asleep at the switch the fourth one the truth is that decision makers in the office were never asleep at the switch so many offices run their businesses very competently very correctly without making any mistake because they were never asleep at the switch they do their work properly the fifth one rajesh was supposed to make sure the paperwork went through before the deadline but it looks like he was asleep at the switch there was some loss in the business because they did some mistake in the paperwork before going to the field they did some mistake in the paperwork which was done by rajesh because rajesh failed to do his work properly so when we look at the origin of this idiom is idiom is from united states of america so when you go on a journey from one place to another place by a train the locomotives often changes tracks that's a known fact right in the 19th century in the united states of america tracks were changed manually by pulling upon a lever now we have all computers but in those times in 19th century it was done by human beings by pulling upon a lever if the person whose responsibility it was to change tracks fell asleep on the job you know what happens it resulted in an accident causing loss of deaths so a person who failed in performing the duty and sleeps at that time when changing the lever of the tracks it resulted in a damage so finally we understand asleep at the switch means failing to do one's own job competently axe to grind axe to grind it is an idiom it means to do or say something with an ulterior motive in mind or to complain about something in other words to have a private or selfish reason for doing something so if you have something inside and do something outside you are really doing an axe to grind let us see in the examples the first one why is rani being so helpful all of a sudden i think she has an axe to grind rani used to never help anybody but suddenly she started helping all of a sudden that's the reason i get a doubt whether she has some private or selfish reason for helping that's the reason i say she has an axe to grind the second one rakesh wants to talk to you i am sure he has an axe to grind be careful and be vigilant be intelligent because he wants to talk to you i think i am sure he has some private selfish reasons to hide that's the reason he has an axe to grind the third one he should not become the chairman of the committee as he has too many axes of his own to grind because i know him very well from the beginning he has lot of selfish reasons to become the chairman of the company nobody knew it i knew it that's the reason he is very selfish he has his own reasons so he has too many axes of his own to grind he should not become the chairman it will be a loss to the company the fourth one i have no axe to grind or no leg to pull i am very fair and straight forward i am not hiding i don't have any selfish reasons i never pull anybody's leg that's the reason i have no axe to grind the fifth one i think the boss has a bit of an axe to grind with you over the way the account was handled the boss was not fair enough because i have seen how the account was handled with you he has something inside he has some reason private reasons that he did not tell you that's the reason he has a bit of an axe to grind so this idiom an axe to grind according to some scholars this expression 
comes from the story written by Charles Minor in the year 1810. In the story, a boy is sitting next to the grindstone. A grindstone is a tool used to sharpen the metals. A stranger carrying a blunt axe flatters the boy with the words and then proceeds to ask him how the grindstone works. The boy shows him how it works by sharpening the man's axe for him. The stranger, having duped the boy, walks away laughing. Many people believe that this story belongs to Benjamin Franklin. So finally, according to this story, that man has something inside, but he did something outside. So axe to grind means to have a private or selfish reasons for doing something.